Well, to begin with, I'm John Wick, and uh, with my wife, I own and operate the Nicasio Native Grass Ranch in Marin County, California. And that's the site of the Marin Carbon Project. And uh, together with Dr. Jeff Creek, I am the co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project. As a uh, rancher, what I've learned through working with Dr. Creek and the Marin Carbon Project is the um, job of growing grass is my primary activity. And in order to do that most effectively, I have uh, a few elements that I interact with. And, and it's very simple in the end. Sunshine, air, soil, and water are the materials that I grow grass with. And in that process, with research, we've learned some amazing things. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. Soil system um, is 50% air and healthy topsoil. There's a lot of infiltration. There's a lot of pore space. And my job as a grass farmer is to try and produce the most grass I can with these different ingredients here. And perennial grasses in our system in California are, are, are preferred grasses because they have much deeper roots and can live uh, to extraordinary ages. They can be three to 500 years old and have nine foot deep roots. Grasses allocate more, ground, more carbon below ground than trees do. Um, grasses occur on Earth where there's not adequate water to support a forest. And grasses occur in rangeland systems. Rangeland systems are the single largest cover type on Earth. There are more acres of rangeland than anything else. Rangelands have grasslands, some shrub, and some trees. So in the management of the grass on my ranch, uh, after a few years of using grazing as a management tool to promote these native perennial plants, under Jeff Creek's direction, we were starting to see an amazing change in the landscape, a higher function of those plants. And so in 2007, around November, Dr. Creek and I were able to go over and you know, meet with a group of scientists at UC Berkeley and ask them, in fact, whether my management of this grass was resulting in increases of soil carbon. And Dr. Wendy Silver, a biogeochemist from UC Berkeley, said, I doubt it, and I doubt we could measure it. But Dr. Creek had been measuring soil organic matter increases on different projects in his for a couple decades. And soil organic matter is 50% carbon. And with his experience in measurement of SOM, or soil organic matter, it gave me the confidence to proceed with the scientific inquiry. So when Dr. Silver realized we were serious and wanted to proceed with that inquiry, she said, before we go much further, it's very important for us to talk about soil carbon. Most soil carbon is in the labile fraction. Most soil carbon is in the bodies of roots and microorganisms. And most of this soil carbon is going to respire to the atmosphere as CO2. And that's actually a good thing. And this is the first time I've ever heard that an emission was a good thing. Dr. Silver suggested that CO2 emissions and methane and nitrous oxide from soil systems is, in fact, a good thing, because it shows us that, that topsoil, the pedosphere, is a living system. And there's actually um, life occurring within it. And so um, she said, if we're going to be looking at increasing soil carbon, it's very important to recognize the labile form is the most abundant soil carbon fraction, most of that's going to the atmosphere. But through different soil processes, some of the labile carbon actually does end up leaving the labile fraction and becoming more permanent and entering the occluded light fraction. And this is carbon now that is physically protected in the soil system. I'm running out of room here. And um, when this happens, it changes the electrical properties of the soil system. And that's very interesting because now rainwater that was subject to gravity and passing through the system becomes detained in a plant available form. So the more soil carbon you have in the occluded light fraction, the more soil water holding capacity you have. And this is physically protected carbon. It will most likely last for a decade or so. And then through other soil processes, some of that carbon then gets consumed by microorganisms it goes towards permanence, which is the heavy fraction. And likewise, it changes the water holding capacity of the soil and is permanent. This is now carbon 
it's the result of uh, being consumed by organisms and um, discharged through their waste or their bodies, and it's chemically bonded inside microsites within the soil, and it's permanent. And so our question to Dr. Silver is, is the management of this graph system somehow increasing soil carbon in the more permanent fractions? And she said, I doubt it, and I doubt you could measure it. And that was in 2007. But Jeff's confidence um, drove us to go ahead and look at it scientifically. And so in order to ask the question whether we're going to increase soil carbon, Dr. Silver said we need to get a baseline. So we conducted a soil survey of 35 sites in Marin and Sonoma County on pasture systems that were currently under management. It's typical of the soil we were looking at. So these were dairy operations and beef operations. And we found something amazing. We found a range of soil carbon that was from 50 to 250 tons of carbon per hectare. Hectare is two and a half acres. And this was surprising to everyone, including Dr. Silver. She wanted to know what had happened historically on these high carbon sites. So we went back and interviewed the land managers. They had all applied wet dairy manure as a disposal solution to the top of the soil to get rid of it. When we asked them what their disposal or their application rate was, they would say, well, how much do you have? So there was no formula to it. They did see a response in increased grass over time. So there was a reason for them to do it. Um, and so looking at a Increased soil carbon under a topical application of an organic amendment was pretty exciting. Then Dr. Silver sent the soil to the lab, and we had a carbon date, and this is very important. She found carbon in the more permanent or calcitrant forms that was statistically significant, permanent, and was less than a decade old. That was very exciting news to everyone. So based on that, we designed a set of experiments on my ranch in Marin County. Um, and these were randomly assigned treatment plots and control plots side by side with a buffer, 25 meter by 65 meters. And before we did any uh, treatment, we had uh, a lot of conversations around what, what the best form of this would be. And the dairy manure clearly worked. It had done something. But it also has a tremendous uh, emission uh, factor that would have probably offset any carbon gain. It also has uh, impacts on waterways and, and several other problems. So Dr. Creek suggested that we perhaps should put a half inch of compost. Now compost is um, a biologically stable carbon nitrogen complex. And we picked a half inch application uh, because that was enough material to uh, most likely have a benefit, but not enough to cover the plants. So we wanted to keep the grass plants intact so that they could continue to perform photosynthesis. But we wanted to put enough material out that we could see the effect of it. So in December 8th of 2008 on my ranch, on three blocks of plots with control, and then in the Sierras, we duplicated the whole experiment up there. We applied a half inch of compost on grazed rangeland systems. Prior to the treatment, we did installation of soil moisture and soil temperature probes. UC Davis, Dr. Val Ebner conducted a complete above-ground biomass mapping exercise. We knew how many plants and what types were moved on the plot. And Dr. Silver did a complete biogeochemical analysis of all the soil systems. And then we applied the compost. And then by May, uh, both of our different systems had been grazed by different grazing management. And we went back in and measured the results. Now, it's important to realize that by moving the experiment up into the chairs also, we bracketed California's Mediterranean rangeland system. And in doing so, we, we um, tested the difference between different soil types, different grass types, different grazing management, different climate, and used the exact same compost, which we uh, found in Sacramento between the two sites in all different directions. And in May, after all of the grazing and compost, we went back in and measured the results. And the first thing we saw was, was really impressive. We measured a 50% increase of forage production compared to the control. And then we measured the water through our sensors that we'd installed. And we, we measured 26,000 liters more water per hectare compared to the control. This is a huge amount of water. And that was an exciting result right there. And then for our purposes, we went in and assessed the soil carbon. And what we first measured was a, there was a range of carbons, and that's really important. There, one of the sites, I think there was something like 3,000 pounds more carbon 
and um, there's an average of about 2,000 pounds of carbon per hectare increase. This is per hectare. That was very exciting news. We knew how much carbon was in the soil. We knew how much carbon was in the compost. We knew how much carbon was respired to the atmosphere by measuring uh, weekly um, respiration with an infrared gas analyzer. And um, above all of that carbon, there was an additional 2,000 pounds of carbon that came into the system. Very exciting outcome. And the question was, how did that happen? And so in my education, what I learned is that green plants produce oxygen and moisture to the atmosphere. And that's a very important good thing. But what I never realized until this project was that atmospheric CO2, the most, fourth most abundant thing in the air, is a gas. And there's a gas under pressure spreads itself out evenly and fills whatever vessel it's in. And the atmosphere is a vessel. And so as the stomata, the microscopic holes on the bottom of all green leaf plants open to release oxygen and moisture to the atmosphere, CO2 rushes in and fills the leaf. Then under the sun's energy, the plant pulls in soil moisture and soil nutrients through the microscopic hairs on the root. And recombines all of that as carbohydrates. We have soil moisture as well going in. So under photosynthesis, the plant now takes atmospheric CO2, soil moisture, soil nutrients or minerals, and recreates them as carbohydrates. What I didn't realize until this project was that, I'm sorry, that's the six, um, all of the carbon and carbohydrates comes out of the air and nowhere else. I'd always assumed it had come in through the roots and that the carbon and carbohydrates was a soil sourced carbon. It's not, it's the opposite. And so this is what's happened in our system here. Um, there are four pathways where that carbon ends up in the soil. One of them is the roots themselves are carbon, carbohydrate roots. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, grass plants allocate more carbon below ground than trees do, and it's in the form of carbohydrates. During different grazing events and different plant um, processes, the plant discharges a tremendous amount of sugar around the root zone, the rhizosphere, which is that digestive tract of the immune system to a plant. And this sugar feeds the population of microorganisms who then take this carbon in the form of carbohydrates and break it down, starting this pathway either towards permanence or towards respiration of the atmosphere. But we have two pathways here. Uh, the actual roots are carbohydrates. We have got an exudate or a discharge of sugar all around the rhizosphere. We have mycorrhizal fungi extending a plant's ability to retrieve nutrients from great distances. Tremendous amount of carbon and glomalin, the sugar from the plant, becomes a sticky substance that uh, uh, fungi make passages out of to exchange the nutrients for more and more sugar. Tremendous amount of carbon in the soil. And then the fourth pathway is the topical, or the actual accumulation of biomass on the soil surface. Um, this is usually the litter or dry material from plants, or the manures of animals that eat the plants, or manures of animals that eat the animals that eat the plants. And soil systems over time have developed populations of organisms, gophers, earthworms, different microorganisms, who pull this carbon and nitrogen down into the soil. And this increases water holding capacity, which results in more plant growth, which results in more removal of carbon from the atmosphere. So this is the pathway we primed the system by exercising. And it resulted in increased water holding capacity, which resulted in more plant growth, which has resulted in more carbon coming out of the atmosphere. Very exciting outcome. We're very happy with the, with the whole process. And then the conversation was around, well, should we put a second treatment of compost now? And I'm so glad we didn't, because Letting the system run, we observed an additional ton of carbon coming into the system the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year. We're on our sixth year now. And every year, more carbon has come into the system on its own from a single application of compost. And this is really exciting to us. So we sent our data set to Dr. Bill Parton at Colorado State, author of the Century Model. And after looking at the results, he suggested that what we've done here is ignited a state change. It's resulting in an ongoing total carbon sequestration, transfer of carbon from the atmosphere to the biosphere into the petosphere from a single event. And that perhaps will go on for 30, if not 100 years. Very exciting outcome. And um, 
that's kind of the foundation of the Marine Carbon Project. We've gone now out onto three full scale operations in Marin County, the Strauss Dairy, the Stemple Creek Ranch, and the Corda Dairy. And we've put thousands of yards of compost out in the fall. And we've already seen anecdotally the results. There's a, a, a strong difference between the, well, for instance, the population of earthworms is, is much higher in the treated plot. And in that system, we were able to compare half inch and quarter inch applications because Dr. Parton suggested that a quarter inch would have done the same thing. And um, I think that's a nice beginning here. I'd like to touch on one other thing in terms of the atmospheric CO2 and the relevant context for this work. Uh, historically, there's been a range of atmospheric CO2 levels. We crossed 400 parts per million for the first time a week or two ago. And there's a series of numbers that are very important in this. 350 parts per million, 320, 290, and 190. And interesting to look at is the, the um, atmospheric CO2 levels over time. And so I'll represent this in a couple different time scales. So when we look at the bubbles of air in the Vostok ice sampling, we can, we can see a range of atmospheric CO2 levels between 190 and 290 over 800,000 years. And the pattern is very interesting. There's a sudden increase of CO2 up to 290, then a slow decrease, sudden increase, slow decrease. This happens every 100,000 years. And then sometime around 10,000 years ago, and I'm not sure exactly where this starts, but there was actually a change. And then ever since then, atmospheric CO2 levels have been increasing. Dr. Keeling started measuring atmospheric CO2 in 1958. The first thing he observed was a five part per million or six part per million increase and six part per million decrease. This is a very interesting yearly signature of the northern hemisphere deciduous forest going through photosynthesis and decomposition. And the next year, same thing, except what's happening now is a trend going up like this. And so, as I said, we're at 400 parts per million currently. All of the conversations that I've been participating in with the Marine Carbon Project have been around emission reductions, which fall in an upward climbing wedge. And there's a very important number here, 350 parts per million. And the reason for that is historically, 2 to 3 percent of the sun's energy has stayed on Earth's system. Sun comes in as photons, strikes surfaces, and leaves as long wave radiation. In 1982, approximately, atmospheric CO2 densities cross 350 parts per million and are blocking that exit. And from that point in time, now the heat is staying in the system, causing increased warming. So what's very exciting to us is that we've done that single event. We've ignited a state change that results in an ongoing carbon removal from the atmosphere. And we have the potential now to do agricultural practices that result in ongoing removal by managing our waste stream and getting all of the organic materials that we can. It could go into landfills typically and cause greenhouse gas emissions. We can avoid that process, compost that material, apply that land or apply that material to landscapes at scale, and ignite a state change. So, so clearly something happened here, and there's some evidence that agricultural practices 10,000 years ago, plowing in particular, broke the structure of the heavy fraction, resulting in microorganisms having access to that carbon, which they do, and then they consume it, and their waste products are plant available nutrients, which results in a biomass response, which is why we plow. But in doing so, we've actually been releasing soil carbon, uh, fossil carbon, and we see a global signature of that. And then um, burning of fossil fuels and coal and things like that are the same things, but um, deforestation and burning of fossil fuels has resulted in an increasing CO2 level. And our data shows that an agricultural event can be beneficial and Compost application on grazed rangeland actually can restore the resource base from which our production comes. And it's our proposal to look at atmospheric CO2 as a vast, untapped free resource that can be put to beneficial use in our food and fiber producing soils while creating an abundance of carbohydrates, which are food, fuel, fiber, and flora. 